several years back, I was reading Oswald Chambers' devotional, and I don't remember the exact words, but I remember the the gist of the devotion that day, and it was essentially that there is a call for us to love Jesus more than the ministry Jesus has given us. It is very easy to serve Him. Sometimes it's hard to love Him. And so as I've been going through my devotions, I've been asking the Lord to help me not see His text or this ministry that He has blessed me to serve in. I don't want to see this as is the epitome of my faith walk. I want the epitome of my faith walk to be about Him, my relationship with Christ. And so I was reading in Luke chapter 4. I'm going to invite you to turn to Luke 4. And I want to give you the backdrop of this message. Not not often do I prepare a message and not get to deliver it to its desired audience. This, At least the first half of this message was not meant for you guys. I had prepared it for this past Friday morning for the jail. And when I got to the jail... I didn't make it past the, the the doors because currently our our jail had three inmates in in the library being held and a whole bunch more in the holding cell kind of to be processed because there are so many inmates right now that we can't house them. I don't want to use this as a as a platform for any sort of political push, but I will say I believe our call is to either stop complaining about the jail expansion or start a heavier evangelistic outreach to Hohenwald. Because something's got to give. If we complain about the number of inmates, the only way to to fix that is for their hearts to be changed or fork over more tax money for a bigger jail. Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 14. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and the news about Him spread through all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. It was his custom he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. The book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him and he opened the book and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives in recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. He closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Heavenly Father, I ask you right now to please cast light on your text. If we are to fall in love with Jesus and not just the ministry that Jesus has given, then I'm asking you to please help us to fall in love with the heart of Christ. You gave Jesus a job to do while he was here. It's my prayer that today as we examine Jesus' words and His actions, that You would help us to follow suit. 
you've told us that if we claim to be in him, then we must walk as Jesus walked. That is a tall order in light of a text like this. God, I don't know what your plans are, but somehow, some way, we need to leave this place changed. I'm asking you to do that work. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. You see, the title of the message today is When Jesus Shows Up in Hohenwald. That sounds kind of like a, a, a funny title because as we know theologically that Jesus is in us and whenever Jesus is in us then Jesus by nature is here with us he's in our presence so you can say in a sense Jesus is with us here so why the title of this well then I would ask the question why so many biographies why even the book of Acts do we have account after account where it seems that the Lord showed up in a mighty way he was already there. Is he more mighty in some situations than others? Uh, I think we can can say that when we say the Lord's going to show up in Hohenwald, that means in some extraordinary sense, people cannot miss the fact that the Lord is doing something here. That's what's meant by when the Lord shows up in Hohenwald. There's something that happens in in the body of Christ that people cannot deny that the Lord is at work. I want us to begin unpacking this text because Jesus goes to His hometown. He goes to to where He grew up and He gives this message and it is a short message. Honestly, Jesus' sermon is today the Scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That was His sermon. Don't expect one from me that short. It's my job to to do what we talked about last week, explain or make clear why his message was so short. Yes, sir. The wrong things in the bulletins? Ah, no, that's okay. The wrong things in the bulletins. I'm not going to tell you what Don said, but he said the wrong things in the bulletins. Some of them got it right. Okay, well, if you got it right, just rub it in to the person next to you that you're blessed and highly favored, and they're not. I will say this is not George's fault. George stuffs our bulletins, which you guys have no idea how much I thank George. George is one of those silent servants in this church. Thank you, George. George, this one's on me, my friend. I'm sorry, I blew it. Um, so, so more being printed. Okay, if you just give them to Buddy, he'll throw them from up top. Um, I, I apologize for the mistake. I also apologize that you now know I'm human. It had to come out at some point. I'm just going to keep rocking and rolling with this if it's okay with you. I want to begin at verse 14 when, when Jesus shows up in Hohenwald. Please look with me at verse 14. It says, And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about Him spread through all the surrounding district. I think that's what it looks like when Jesus shows up. The power of the Holy Spirit is evident, and people can't stop talking about what Jesus is doing. That's what it means when the when Jesus shows up. Now, with that being said, he doesn't want to be a silent partner. When you finally get your inserts, that's the first point. He does not want to be a silent partner. 
Jesus didn't want to come in and just quietly do his work and leave. Now we do see at the end of parable, or I mean after miracle after miracle, he'll tell people, don't tell folks that I did this. There's another reason why he would say this. We'll get into that some other time. But suffice it to say, when Jesus showed up, he didn't want to go unnoticed by everybody there. I want to read to you from investopedia.com, okay? This is a business site, Investopedia. It's a, it's a dictionary for people like me who don't, don't really do much with the business world. The question is, what is a silent partner? What is a silent partner in the business world? Please listen to this. A silent partner is an individual whose involvement in a partnership is limited to providing capital to the business. A silent partner is seldom involved in the partnership's daily operations and does not generally participate in management meetings. A silent partner also is known as a limited partner since his liability is, typ uh, liability is typically limited to the amount invested in the partnership. Apart from providing capital, an effective silent partner can benefit an enterprise by giving guidance when solicited, providing business contacts to develop the business, and stepping in for mediation when a dispute arises with other partners. Regardless of such requests, it is considered a background role that cedes control to the general partner. This requires the silent partner to have full confidence in the general partner's ability to grow the business. The silent partner also may need to ensure that their management styles or corporate visions are compatible. Jesus is not a silent partner. He doesn't Come with capital and say, anything you need, just let me know. But hey, I'm going to be out of the decision-making process. He doesn't do that. He doesn't look to us and say, does, does Bert's corporate vision plan of the church fit mine? And if not, yeah, we'll go with his. God is not a silent partner in His work. He is the partner. And He calls us to, to come alongside in His business. He, he owns it all. And I'm telling you this because this text says Jesus' public ministry was returning from Galilee in the power of the Spirit and news about Him spread through all the surrounding district. Whenever Jesus is doing His work, it is done in full power of the Spirit and it is not going to be quiet. So my question is, when, when we go out into the community, do they know that Jesus Christ is fully in charge of the business of the church, capital C, or do they think churches are in charge and Jesus is just the silent partner who funds the stuff that we as churches do? Look at verse, look at verse 18. This is the heart of, of what Jesus came to do. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set, those who are, uh, set free those who are oppressed and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Not only is He not a silent partner, He comes to be a liberator. He comes to be a liberator. Now, I want to just share with you what that liberation looks like from God's point of view. 
he begins by saying he came to preach the gospel. This means that there is good news and it is to be shouted from the mountains. And if there's good news, then there must be by nature some sort of bad news. And yes, there is. For the audience that was listening to Jesus, let me tell you what the bad news was. It was just because you have uh, religious ancestors, Jews, doesn't mean that you're in right standing with the Lord Almighty. Just because you go through the prescribed motions of the law, of religious activities, it does not mean that your heart is clean. And guys, I'm going to tell you, that's the same today. That is absolutely the same today. Just because you have a religious mama or grandmama or granddaddy or whoever else in your family does not mean that you have right standing with the Lord. Just because you come to the church, just because you may drop money on a plate, just because you have grown up in this place does not necessarily mean that you have favor with the Lord. He's telling this original audience there is good news to be told and that good news is He has come to set people free. But you have to understand the bad news in order to understand how good the good news is. You see, what He was preaching to these people is the testimony of so many of us who grew up in the church. I do want to see a a raise of hands here. How many of us gave our lives to Christ before we were 18? Okay. That's a good chunk of us in this room. We gave our life to Christ before we were 18. That means that we grew up in the church. Most likely, we those of us who just raised our hands, we grew up in the church. We had this kind of religious background. We went to church. We were in church long before we ever gave our life to Christ. And for those of you who don't have one of those juicy testimonies, you know, like where you did drinking and drugs and wild, wild women and gave them up by age five, if, if, if that's not your testimony, it's still okay to understand Jesus came to set you free too. It doesn't matter who you are or what your sin is. And it doesn't matter your past or your ancestors. He came to set you free. What a huge blessing that is. To know that no matter what your family ancestry is, He came with good news. Now not only did He come to preach the Gospel, it says He came... To preach to the poor. Now many of us in here think that poor means you don't have as much money as the next guy. Well, that's not how they understood poor. That is absolutely not how they saw poor. In their mind, poor was somebody who had some sort of need that was going unmet. You can be a billionaire and have a physical disease. And you're poor. Steve Jobs, right? Back whenever he he started Apple, and and he took everybody's money. Everybody in here somehow had given money to Steve Jobs. Somehow, someway, your family contributed to his wealth somewhere down the line. And all our money went to him somehow through Apple, but he still had physical ailments that led to his death. And in in the biblical sense, the physical ailment made him poor. If you are depleted of relationships, if there is a relationship that suffers in your family, maybe you and your spouse don't get along, or maybe you and your children are estranged, or maybe you've prayed for children for so long and haven't happened, that that qualifies you as poor. Perhaps you've done something in society and you now have a black mark on your name. 
you might as well be wearing a scarlet letter because everybody in town has marked you as something. That qualifies you as poor when you hear these words. And Jesus said, I came with good news to everybody who is depleted somewhere in their life. Not only does he preach the gospel of the poor, it says that he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives. I'm going to need a couple of readers. John 8, 34 through 36. Acts 8, 23. And 2 Timothy 2, 25 and 26. I want us to look at this idea of captives. John 8, 34. Who will read that for us, please? 34 through 36. Okay, so according to this text... Who is the slave? You can cheat. Use the book. Who? Anybody who's committed sin. Wow, if that's not a broad brush, I don't know what is. Everybody who's committed sin is a slave. You are captive. Acts 8, 23. We'll read that. Alright? Did you hear that? It, 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 it's saying that there is bondage and it's not necessarily a jail cell. Truth be told, I go to jail and see people who are a lot more free in there than I do coming out of the jail and see people who are in bondage. Okay, who's got 2 Timothy 2, 25 and 26? All right. All right. The devil captures people to do his will. That's bondage. Essentially, Jesus is saying, based on this text in Isaiah, if you have fallen into sin, I've come with the keys to the jail cell. I've come to take the handcuffs off and release you from the life of sin. As for those of us who raised our hands and we gave our life to Christ at an early age, sometimes it is hard for us to wrap our minds around how freeing that is unless you have been somebody who has been bound in sin year after year after year after year. And Jesus finally releases your cuffs. And you're free. He comes to give sight to the blind. I'm just going to throw this out. John 9, 1 through 12, Matthew 9, 27 through 30, Mark 8, 22 through 35. These are stories of physical blindness. Jesus does come to give sight to physical blindness, but I want us to read a couple other texts. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Matthew 23, 16. 
and Ephesians 1.18. If someone would grab 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, please. And everybody else turn there to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Somebody stand and read that, please. Okay, so this text says that, that, that what is it that's blinded? It's the mind. It is not your eyes, it is your mind. Do you realize the enemy has come into your life and he has blinded your mind from the understanding of who Jesus is? If you have come into this service today and you have sashayed in and this service doesn't mean anything to you and you go straight on out of here without life change, your mind has been blinded. Because Jesus Christ says, I have come in to, to take those blinders off. Okay, who's got Matthew 23, 16? Who's he talking to there? Those are the religious leaders. Those are the people who not only know this book, but teach this book and lead people in this book, yet they've missed Him. He's telling these religious leaders, if, if everything is about keeping the law, then you have missed it. Your mind is blind. If you've missed the relationship with the Father part, you are a blind guide. Okay, Ephesians 1.18, who's got that? Ephesians 1.18, okay? He wants to open the eyes of your heart so that it can be enlightened. Jesus came not just so that people could get a physical healing with their eyes, but so that their minds and their hearts would, would come to a point where they see that Jesus Christ loves them. God the Father loves them, and He sent Jesus His only Son. I, I tell you this because somebody in here has probably sat in services like this year after year after year, and you have heard, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you. But I'm telling you today, Jesus loves you, and He proved it with His life. And this may just be the first time it goes from your ears to your heart. And when He loves you, He proves it with a blood sacrifice to cover for your sins. So, so he, he came to give blind, uh, blind eyes sight, but it says that He came to set, the, uh, set free the oppressed. Look at the text. To set those uh, free, those who are oppressed. Listen to what the word oppressed is. It is to to break into pieces or to shatter. Go back with me a few weeks ago when Jesse was up here on the stage. Hopefully that's enough for those of you who, who were here that day. And, and Jesse had the privilege of shattering a mirror up here on the stage. Those pieces weren't going back together again. I don't care if you got Gorilla Glue. Uh, Humpty Dumpty was not going back together. That mirror was shattered all over the place. That's what this word means to be oppressed. Listen to this. Uh, put your eyes right there on verse 18 to set free those who are oppressed. Look at that word oppressed and let me explain. 
this is the only place in the New Testament that this word is used in the present tense. The present tense emphasizes the ongoing effect of sin that lingers on after a particular sin or a problem has happened in the past. Explain what that means. That means you did something or you lived through something long ago. Don Pollock, if you don't mind, I'm going to pick on you because I know you love me. Don has unashamedly said he had a drinking problem years ago. He, he's, he's told all of us that, that there was a drinking problem. Ashley, you lived through it, right? Sally, you lived through it, right? Before he came to Christ, were there certain pieces of your life that were shattered that never could have been put back together because what, what Don did back then still continued to play out? I tell you that. Because so many of us have that story. It may not be alcohol, but it's something. There's been a sin back here somewhere, and it was committed, and we can't undo it. Our life was broken at this point. The feelings and the emotions and the anger and all of this stuff just came out, and there's pieces of our life that shattered. Maybe it was a divorce. Maybe it was some sort of, I, I don't know, but your life came apart right here, and you're having to live with it today and today and today and today, and now that you're an adult, you've got a whole bunch of todays and it's almost like you can't get rid of this because it is still so fresh in your mind. It might as well have happened yesterday even though it was 30 years ago because you're living with the same present tense result of this past tense sin. That's what it means to be oppressed. Another example is those guys in the jail or the men in prison or the women in prison who a long time ago, they committed some sin, but guess what? They are currently having to, to face the present tense action of their past tense action. That's what this word oppressed is. And he said, some of you in this crowd have had something happen in your life a long time ago and it has shattered you. Your life can't be put back together because of the sin. And please, please understand that is He is saying this. When He's talking about this bitterness and this hatred, where He's standing when He's, when he's speaking to them, not but just a few miles away at Mount Arbel. The Romans, just prior to Jesus' birth, had been in, in such rage against the Jewish people that there was a battle at that place and, and, and God's people went into the hills to hide, and then some of them decided to fight, and the Romans came up into those hills, and they killed about 5,000 people in one day, throwing them down the, the cliffs, throwing, spearing them, killing their kids, killing their babies, killing their spouses. All of this happened in one day, and Jesus is now talking to this crowd, and he's saying, some of you guys have been so crushed by a past tense event that you're living with it today. Oh yeah, I can hear some of those people in the crowd saying, that was my mom and my dad that those Romans did that to. Those were my kids. I escaped. My family was one of those thousands. Jesus is saying, yeah, you know what? I came 
so that 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 happened in the past doesn't have to hold you captive today. He came to set those who are oppressed free. He says he came to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Let's go to Luke 19.10 and somebody else to 2 Corinthians 6 verses 1 and 2. So Jesus came to declare the favorable year of the Lord. Who's got Luke 19.10? Somebody stand and read it real loud, please. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Let me tell you, if you're in here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, Jesus is on a search and rescue mission for you today. He is not giving up searching for you because you are not His family yet. People say we're all God's kids. No, we're not. We're all God's creation, but we're not all His kids. That happens when you choose to give your life to Christ. John 1.12 Who's got 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2? If you've come in here today in Jesus Christ, is not the top priority of your life and you have never received His mercy and grace and free gift of salvation, I'm telling you, today is the day of your salvation. If you walk out of here, I cannot promise you'll have another opportunity to give your life to Him. But He is looking for you today. And because He is still looking for you and He's given you an opportunity to accept His free gift of salvation, it is a favorable day because He has given you something you cannot earn. What an amazing thing that that the, the God of the universe who created us and who knows us and all of our rottenness would still want to have a personal relationship with us. That's what He offers you today. Now with that said, many of us in here would think, wow, that is a a great message. I'm glad that you're giving it to all of those, those lost folks. That is definitely the message you should have preached Friday at the jail. I wish they would have let you in. Let's go to the next point. He came to give life, not to pass judgment. Look at verse 21. After he's read all these things in verse 18, verse 21 says, He began to say to them, Today the Scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And then we know he he rolls up the scrolls and that was it. And my question is, is that all that Isaiah said? I want you to go with me to, to the book of Isaiah chapter 61. So we're going to find out what Jesus was quoting here. Go to the book of Isaiah. Chapter 61. I'm going to read from verses 1 and 2. If you can do this in your Bible, feel free Like with mine here, I'm able to hold these pages right here. I can see 61 where he's quoting, and I can see right here what he is quoting, both at the same time. That's just how cool my Bible is. 
I want to read from Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. What part of that was not in Luke 4? Say it loud and proud. The day of vengeance of our Lord. You realize Jesus left that part out. Some would say he stopped his sermon just a little too soon. I don't think he did. Jesus didn't stop his sermon too soon because the day of vengeance is not why he came. Look with me at John 3, 16 through 18, and Luke 9, 51 through 56. John 3, 16 through 18. Someone read that, please. Seventeen and eighteen tell us Jesus did not come to judge the world. At least not this first appearing of Jesus in incarnation. He didn't come to judge. What did he come to do? To save the world. All right, Luke nine fifty one through fifty six. Who's got it? Shall I choose a volunteer? Luke nine fifty one through fifty six. Do you hear this? The Son of Man didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. I can just hear these two disciples. They, they've been with Jesus. They love Jesus. They, they know what it looks like to, to love righteousness and to hate sin. They, they've, they've seen it in His life. They know that Jesus doesn't give His life to sin. That He, he is so set on doing the Father's will that He is living... A, a sinless life and, and here is an opportunity for for Jesus to set right what is wronged in this, this particular place and His disciples get all excited saying, now we can see some judgment come. And they say, hey, can, can we call down fire? Because you see at that very mountain that had happened before. And Jesus rebuked them. Why did He rebuke them? Because this is not the day of judgment. This is the day of salvation. That is so hard for us. Please understand, that is so hard for us when we've been wronged. 
when we see sin all around us and somehow we almost get just a little bit giddy when somebody gets what they deserve. We're so excited when somebody... Let me just ask you this, and I'm going to throw this out and do not answer this out loud. When our country barbecued the Iranian leader, what went through your heart? Was it a statement of praise God, He got what He got? Or did you think, oh Lord, was there anybody there to tell Him about your kingdom and your righteousness? Did he ever hear the truth about Jesus Christ? Oh yeah, I'm thankful that the end of terror was happening so that no more of our American lives were, were, were lost. But, but how many of us, our first thought was, praise God, we got him and he got what he deserved. And I'm telling you, as the body of Christ, Jesus is telling us that's not the heart to have. And it goes against everything we've ever heard when we stand and when we pledge and when we sing. And there is such a battle going on inside the hearts and minds of us right now. I'm promising you as you're listening to this, you're thinking, to whom do I give allegiance? I'm telling you, Jesus said, I came. Not to judge the world. That's coming. I came to give them life. That is hard. It is so very hard. Especially when it gets closer to home and the offenses against you or your loved ones personal. He didn't come to fulfill my expectations of Him, but rather the Father's. The next point, He does not come to fulfill my expectations of Him, but rather the Father's. Look at verse 15. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. They loved him. Here's our hometown hero. Verse 22. After the sermon, not just because it was short, all were speaking well of him. And wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. Verses 27 through 29. There were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elijah and the the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. They got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the bow of the hill which their city had been built in order to throw him down off the cliff. Did you hear that? At the beginning of the sermon... He was praised. He couldn't do enough good. He was the hometown hero. But by the time he got through explaining his position, they were ready to go out on the hillside and kill him. They went from parade to execution post. Like that. And the reason is their expectations of him weren't being fulfilled. You see, as long as Jesus stays within the bounds of the people's expectations, they were fine with Him coming to release captives and open blind eyes and set free the oppressed. But when He put a a face on it, it became a different story. How many of us in here, kids, these are hymn books full of songs, even have notes. You can tell you when to go up and down. I 
I remember as a kid, us singing, I love to tell the story. Just listen to these words. I'm not singing them, I'm going to read them to you. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus in His glory, of Jesus in His love. I love to tell the story because I know tis true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story. It will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and His love. I've said for a long time, nothing will make a liar out of a Baptist more than that hymn. For one, we don't love to tell it. We love to hear it. And until you've shared Christ recently with somebody, I don't think you should ever sing this song. But more than that, here's the question in light of today's text. When you say, I love to tell the story, it'll be my theme and glory. Well, what about with the person that, that you absolutely detest? Is it really a story you love to tell? Or do you think, no, Jesus is good and I love to tell a story as long as it's in the, the polished up class of people that I like. I did find it quite ironic. The next hymn over <laughs> is set my soul afire. And I was thinking if we're honest, we're hoping and praying set their soul afire. If you just love to hear the story and not tell the story, you might as well sing set their soul afire, Lord. Set their soul afire. A million grope in darkness. <laughs> I, I say that because if Jesus doesn't meet your expectations, He meets the Father's expectations, then at some point you're probably going to get frustrated with Jesus and what He calls you to do. Because listen to this, this next part. He comes to give life to people that we may not want to or that we may want to see suffer. Again, look at verses 25 through 27. He's talking to a group of absolute hardcore, God-fearing Jewish people who, who love the Scriptures. And he says, But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. Essentially he's saying God could have taken care of any of the Jewish folks there, but he, you know who he went to? He went to a Gentile woman. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet. None of them was cleansed, but only Naaman, the Syrian, also a Gentile. And Jesus is saying, I have come to set free the oppressed, to give sight to the blind of people you really, really, really don't like. And it's the people whom you have the hardest heart that He wants to go after most. I don't know who yours is. But my guess is there's somebody in every one of us's life who we really don't care if they ever get saved. Now we would never say that because we're church folks. But if you're honest, and I've shared with you there have been people that it has taken me years to forgive. If you're honest, there are people in your life you really don't care whether or not they step into eternity with or without Jesus. It would be nice if they give their life to Christ, but you sure don't want to be the one to have to do it to tell them. 
And there's a part of you that's probably hoping and praying that they get what they deserve. Anthony Ponsetti was living in Texas when God asked him to move to Miami. Some of you who've watched the Experience in God DVD uh, set that goes along with the study, you've seen his testimony. Uh, he was shocked to discover why God moved him from Texas to Miami. The Panamanian director Manuel, uh, Manuel Noriega had been arrested on drug trafficking charges was in a prison in Miami. A couple of months later, some Southern Baptist evangelists, Clifton Brennan and Rudy Hernandez, led Noriega to Jesus Christ. Like it or not, Noel Noriega is your brother in Christ. Well, Anthony was asked to disciple Noriega. And here's what he said. He said, I can't do it. My brother died because of drugs. And here is one of the biggest drug traffickers in the world. Disciple him? No, I hate him. But he had been through experiencing God and on said he knew that God had invited him to be a part of his work with Noriega. And this was his crisis of faith. Would he obey? He says his heart softened and he agreed to disciple Noriega using experience in God. I tell you this because if we believe this book, and Jesus Christ came to preach the gospel to the poor, to proclaim the release to captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set free those who are oppressed, and proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, and to people who most folks hate with every ounce of their being, and if we believe other texts that say we as the church are the body of Christ and He is the head, we are the hands and feet, then guess what we are called to keep doing? We are called under the power of the Holy Spirit to do exactly what Jesus had begun to do. Preach the Gospel to the poor. Proclaim release to the captives. Recovery of sight to blind. And set free the oppressed. Proclaiming the favorable day of the Lord. That is our call if we follow Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I come to You right now and I'm asking and begging only because of Jesus and only because I know that You have given Your Holy Spirit in order us to do things that we cannot do on our own. I'm asking, Lord, that You would please take us as the body of Christ and begin to etch on our hearts this longing to do what Jesus did. If you began to do a work in the Gospels and you continued to do a work in the book of Acts, and I know that you continue to do a work in us today, then my guess is you want to continue to do today what you did back then. God, all around us, Probably even in this very room, there are people who are crushed by past sins, who are blind, maybe even heard this whole sermon and still have a hardness over their heart and their mind. And I'm asking, Lord, please set their sight free. God, I thank you the amazing work of salvation that You did in me, but it is not enough to leave it with me. I'm asking that You would give it to others around me. I'm also asking that You would forgive me of those times where 
quick to pass judgment. I don't want to be your hands and feet. God, just because you've called me to ministry doesn't mean that it's easy for me to follow you. And I confess in front of this church that there have been days I just don't want to see anybody that's oppressed or blind or needy. I want to just take care of the clean, good ones. Forgive me. Forgive us. God, you're calling us to a really messy job. It's going to be full of frustration and heartache, and joy, redemption. God, this is an assignment that we can't do on our own because our prejudices are big. Our memories are quick to remember what people did. Truthfully, our flesh longs for them to get what they deserve. You're going to have to live your life through us if you want lost folks loved on. Begin with us today. I'm asking in Jesus' name. Amen.